Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Stevenson. I'm founder and CEO of Forward. And today we're going to talk about how to double your AUM growth, deliver the best client experience possible, and grow your advisory practice by 30% without hiring anyone. So first, let's take a look at how we work with other large firms to succeed. Forward's been working with Invesco now for about three years. And at Invesco, we deploy our technology to help them personalize that skill. We provide them with insights and ways and means to be able to help their sales force see things that they hadn't seen before and would otherwise take a long time to uncover. Uh, so really great results at Invesco. We're also working with LPL Financial here to help them drive growth. Um, and there we're bringing together insights from CRM and enterprise data and providing them with next best actions to enable them to drive growth. So firstly, who's this for? If you want to provide top level service to your clients and get referrals to grow organically, this is for you. This is firmly for RIAs. Um, and if you want to increase your top firm's top line revenue, this is for you. If you're struggling to add large high net worth clients to your book or would like to actually even grow that more, this is for you. If you're looking to double your client book in two years uh, without hiring any additional staff, uh, you come to the right place. And if you are struggling to meet client expectations, then stick around. Being proactive is more and more challenging, so uh, if this is a problem you're facing, uh, this is for you. And if you know that losing 1% of your clients will net $1,000 in lost revenue, stick around. If you're staying close to your clients, in this environment has been challenging, speak to us. If you are swamped serving your existing clients and cannot find the time to grow your business, you've come to the right place. If you're an $8 billion RA firm, we have a solution for you to scale. If you're a $26 billion RA firm, we have a way for you to grow faster and organically. If you're a billion dollar RA, we can help you if you have less than a billion, we can also help you too. And finally, if you think you can't afford the latest AI technology to help grow your business, think again, you come to the right place. So let's take a look at the core truth here. You can grow your practice, increase your revenues and improve client satisfaction by focusing all your time on improving client experiences, hiring more people or by investing in advanced AI tech to automate that for you. However, the problem is that we have limited time and money to pursue these initiatives. And such advanced AI technology is currently available only to the largest financial services firms globally. And uh, you know, if you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't have several euros of time and effort to invest in millions of dollars, plus a lot of human resources, it's gonna be quite challenging. We're the only company dedicated to right-sizing this AI technology and making it custom designed for RIAs that want to grow and scale. That's so what before we get about. into the steps and how-tos, here's a quick background on our company for credibility purposes. So my name is Nathan Stevenson. I'm the CEO and founder of Forward Lane. I come from a small resort town near Durban called Umschlange Rocks. It means place of the reeds in Zulu. I went to university in Cape Town and then on to investment banking and financial services in London, uh, also traveling around the world to Europe, Asia, and Africa before arriving in the US. After pursuing a career in investment banking and quantitative finance at French investment bank BNP Paribas and leading 22 billion euro hedge fund group CQS, where we actually won Credit Dream Team awards and is still ranked number two as a large global macro hedge fund globally by Bloomberg. After that, I went on to become an enterprise architect at a major exchange, the JSC Group, working with NYSE, NASDAQ, CME Group on large scale trading technology projects, bringing them all the way from selling it to the board into implementation. I then went on to leave uh, financial services for a beat and co-founded two other startups, Matchpoint Music, a publishing company, and then hotels by day in New York. Both are successful enterprises and continue to be a great success. 
before I founded Forwarding. So during the financial crisis in 2008, I witnessed hardships faced by clients of financial advisors. And the fact that they lost 30 to 40% of all their savings. And a, a simple question was, how can we actually solve this problem? We spent time at the Credit Suisse private bank in New York City. And what we found is advisors were struggling to bring together all that information that they're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is really the genesis of Forward Lane. Can we help process that research? Can we help uh, increase the bandwidth, make it easier for an advisor to interact more dynamically with the clients? Uh, so on from here, Forward Lane has really grown uh, in leaps and bounds. I wrote the first specification for Forward Lane and it was CTO and CEO initially in the first year or so. And we actually eventually got accepted into the Barclays Techstars Accelerator Program in London and the FinTech Innovation Labs in New York. We got to work with the head of wealth management for Barclays Worldwide and formulating our products. And then in New York with Credit Suisse, Morgan Stanley, as they were thinking about building their next best action engine, along with AIG and Insurance, Alliance Bernstein, Guardian Life, and Fidelity. We really had such an amazing starting ground uh, to begin formulating Forward Lane. Uh, and onwards from there, I've actually had the privilege and honor to go and speak at Yale, MIT, Sloan, Brandeis, and NYU, all schools that we work with. And we've gone on to speak at the World Economic Forum, uh, a study in the AI and financial services. And we also work with Cambridge and Oxford uh, schools. And I've spoken at Invest, Institutional Investor, CFA Institute, and uh, the RA Institute, and more. Um, our team comes from a varied background in financial services. IT and data science from Credit Suisse, Barclays, Amdocs, IHS Markets, and Institutional Investor. We've been deeply dedicated to creating transformative technology that solves human problems, how to provide insights and service at scale. And from this humble start, our AI insights platform for wealth and asset managers is now evolving into an enterprise product used by firms with more than $2 trillion in assets under management. And now, a powerful SaaS solution that small and mid-sized advisory firms can get up and running in minutes through our strategic partnership with Salesforce so and soon other CRMs to uh, come. WealthTech 100 company. We've won uh, various awards for being one of the most innovative uh, AI wealth tech providers in financial services, particularly in wealth and asset management. We've gone on to be featured in Forbes, Institutional Investor, Investment News and Market Watch, amongst others. And we are now uh, have been part of some of the best accelerator programs and institutions globally, including the Investments Association in uh, the UK. We've participated in the Mass Challenge in Boston, where we work with Columbia Threadneedle, Merrill Prize, Putnam Investments. Uh, and uh, 630 program in St. Louis, where we now count them as a fantastic investor, where we've spent time with Edward Jones, amongst others. So that's a bit about us. So let's take a look at what this actually means, our key thesis. And here are six steps to exceptional service and growth. The first step is So let's take a look at our key thesis here. Six steps to exceptional service and growth. And this is all about how to deliver the best client experience and grow your advisory practice by 30% without hiring anyone. And uh, here we're gonna be capturing the desired state by following these key steps. So first activity is focusing on clients that need your attention. So traditionally financial advisors tend to focus most of their attention on the top 20 to 30 percent of their clients, mostly due to time constraints. As a result, a large number of clients end up feeling neglected or like they just don't have that attention that they deserve. So a new way to approaching this is to prioritize your clients based on important conversations related to financial lifestyle goals. Now this is nothing new, we're just 
going to go over some of the activities that can lead to great results. Of course, ensuring each time you review client data it leads to useful and interesting updates is very important. You don't want to be wasting time doing stuff that clients don't know you're doing. So uh, this could be looking about major movements uh, in stories behind the moves and investments. It could be uh, looking at their financial goals and keeping updated as to where they are in terms of life events. You might want to be reassuring them with good, recent, personalized information. And when it comes to those goals, you might want to be sharing financial educational materials that are really specific to them and to their scenarios. And of course, ensuring you're constantly following up on previous discussions about goals, products, as well as those other tasks. This approach, this approach results in a needs-based management of personal attention to higher satisfaction levels across your entire client book, not just your top clients. And personal attention does increase client satisfaction. In fact, according to Ernest & Young, they identified that nearly 40% of clients plan to switch providers within three years. Um, and the reason for this is all about personal attention. In fact, it ranks second in terms of values that are important to clients um, after pricing. Uh, the next step is really about being proactive and personalized. And when we look at how advisors do this, on average, advisors spend time uh, in annual or quarterly reviews, sometimes monthly, but Really, there's segmentation behind this. And what you see from some of this research that Michael Kiki's shared is that the top clients get the most number of reviews and meetings. They get access to educational activities as well as uh, a number of communications. But even these top clients get very limited touch points with the firm. Now, imagine you're in group B or C is it really worth your client's while if you're only going to be in touch with them once or twice a year? How does that compare to a Netflix or Amazon type experience? It simply doesn't. So as a result, advisors do fail to be proactive, mostly because they have too many clients. And, uh, and of course, in, in really uh, adverse scenarios where there's a lot of market volatility, for example, COVID, uh, this is a major reason why clients could actually land up changing advisors or really go out and look for some better service. Um, and of course, you're not going to be getting referrals if you're hardly in touch with your clients. And if, this all really comes down to having a lack of a timely and proactive touch points with them. We conducted a survey of financial advisors at Forward Lane. And what we found is that Advisors are prioritizing their clients reactively, mostly. At Forward Lane, we did a study about how to prioritize communication with the clients. And what we found is that most advisors are being reactive, basically whenever a client calls them. But based uh, on ongoing campaigns is, is another way in company requirements or really the size of the clients. At Forward Lane, we did a survey and we wanted to see how advisors actually prioritize their clients uh, and communicating with them. And the majority of them said it was really reactive whenever a client uh, contacts them. Some of them said it was really based on the size of the clients or in some cases, ongoing campaigns or company requirements. Uh, but really what Michael Kiki has found is that those clients with more than 500K in AUM still found that they were actually being infrequently contacted. Um, and, um, and only half of them really uh, found that they were being contacted frequently enough. And when you looked at those smaller clients, uh, it just showed that uh, really almost 70% of them were really not getting good communications. And then when we look at uh, the percentage of clients who consider their advisors 
frequency and style communication when they're deciding whether or not they should retain his or her services, 85% of them said yes. So this is a big disparity really between what's actually been delivered to clients and what's actually expected. Um, and of course, uh, you know, when we look at the propensity for a client to actually recommend you to a friend or family member, 88% of them said it's the frequency and style of communication that really uh, determines whether or not you'll get that recommendation. Uh, so let's take a little bit of a closer look at that. When leading advisors, you know, target 20 meaningful interactions a day, how many do you really uh, take a look at? Being proactive is ensuring that you're assuring clients that you understand their needs, especially as it relates to their most recent conversations. So let's think like, what actually does this entail? One, it's financial goals. Sharing financial education materials that relates to these conversations. It's productive, helpful, and it shows that you're relating to them personally. It's also about tracking their top investments, whether they're in a model portfolio or it's discretionary. It's really about showing that you're providing value to them by providing news and stories and research that might relate to them to help them understand what's going on with their financial interests. Of course, showcasing your knowledge with sector-based insights uh, is kind of going one step deeper. Not all clients may want that, but certainly if you do provide it, it's gonna show you the, them that you've got the eye, your eye on the ball. Um, and this only helps to establish your credibility and reputation with clients, which leads to more leads and referrals. Of course, on the personal interest side of things, you wanna be in touch with their hobbies, sports, and interests, and I'm sure you are, to better establish that personal connection. Family dynamics is another really key aspect. Uh, life events that are coming up there's a wide range of family dynamics to navigate, whether it's wealth, estate planning, divorce, bereavement, health planning, disability, adoption. Making the connection between key conversations and educational articles, content, and stories that can aid clients to better understand their personal situation, again, is another one of those touch points that's gonna be meaningful to the clients that shows that you're being supportive and helpful to them and their family. Typically, advisors are reviewing clients every quarter or less. But you have to ask yourself the question, is this going to get you a world-class reputation? Is it being product, proactive and productive? Are referrals and growth coming in through the door? Arguably not in that type of scenario. And what about developments between meetings and reviews? How do you keep your eye on the ball, especially when there are so many balls in the air? And that's what we're going to talk about next. So how frequently should you review client accounts? That's a great question. We've seen that an average advisor earning 100,000 or even $200,000 a year, maybe even more, spends about 48% of their time per day in client data gathering, analysis, monitoring, review, and preparation, a call, email, or meeting. Only 20% of time spent per day is possible to provide useful advice to clients and communicate with them. So this is a real balancing act between this big time allocation of client data analysis, review and prep, uh, and using analytical capabilities to review the data and actually delivering the results of the analysis. Many advisors will only review client data just once a year. Can you imagine paying someone to check on your interest just once a year? Uh, neither can I. It just won't happen or if I discovered that I'd simply move my money to an advisor it does give me the time and attention I want. Um, and of course, there's a lot of research out there on why clients fire financial advisors. And really what it's all about is this dynamic of not getting enough attention. In fact, advisors tend to review clients on a quarterly basis just to keep up right now because the world is changing so quickly. And of course, clients need much more attention than before. So let's think about monthly. Many clients would appreciate the fact that you check on their interests on a monthly basis, especially if you're able to provide them something useful beyond the standard reporting. However, let's take a look at recent history. If you only reported to clients on a monthly basis, 
some of the biggest and most dramatic events due to COVID and the biggest causes of financial stress would have been totally missed. Many clients reported that their advisors didn't even call them back after major budget fluctuations due to COVID. And it's this kind of service and reassurance that clients really appreciate. If you're not doing this on a bi-weekly basis, when many advisors are, you could be putting your client base at risk. I especially like this quote from an advisor that shows the stresses and strains of building a practice and staying on top of it. He said, new relationships are about discovery and uncovering tangible benefits. A new client is by their very nature evaluating the merits of entering into the new relationship. As an advisor, I believe there is a special boost that you get from helping someone new that is absent from the process of maintaining existing ones. Personally, I worked hard to build the business, but the process was mostly invigorating. The work to maintain it is just as hard, but the invigoration component is largely absent. From our perspective, clients, we get a common refrain as to why they are seeking a change. The service isn't what it used to be, or I don't think my advice has time for me, or simply that calls and emails go unreturned. And this really is the crux of the matter. In the next video, we'll talk about activity number three. The third activity that, as advisors, we should be doing is to reduce wasted data analysis time. So let's take a look at what that really breaks down to. A typical advisor spends a huge amount of time, almost 50% of their time on actually data analysis. And this includes meeting prep, planning, uh, client servicing tasks, and actually meeting with current clients. Uh, so anytime you're spending searching for or connecting data, switching between different systems, there's time you could be spending actually communicating proactively with clients or focused on outreach with new prospects or even just golfing. It's just a totally wasted time, especially if you're reviewing all the different data from multiple systems, only to come up empty handed because nothing interesting came up when you decided to do the daily analysis. So the activities that we should be undertaking is to aggregate portfolio data, account data, and held away data from your custodial platforms. This is really a first step to saving time and money um, and making sure your client's data is all in one place and you can easily review it. Integration across custodial accounts will allow for an aggregated view of your client's wealth and also help to uncover opportunities to provide holistic advice and deepen your relationships. Uh, we also want to be building a full picture of your clients. Don't waste time switching between different systems or searching for that piece of paper. Gather all the data in the CRM. Keep it up to date with the latest client activities. Be sure to include financial goals, investment and product discussions, personal interests, family dynamics, and of course, other information on a regular basis. And make sure to stay on top of your client follow-ups and not miss any interactions. This is really table stakes here. So we also want to be personalizing your client engagements. So what this means is to use a platform that helps you to surface financial education, news, research, and more so that you don't have to. General marketing platforms can be helpful and in helping to create a newsletter for you, but this one-size-fits-all approach doesn't hit the spot for each individual client. Uh, of course, uh, the benefits to marketing platforms, they serve up newsletters and send them out with ease, and they enable you to white-label them, but personalization really takes it a step further and ensures that the content is directly linked to the current discussions, interests, and goals a client might have in today. Spend minimal time and effort in searching out for specific articles for individual clients. This is very important um, uh, for, for this step. The fourth activity is hyper-personalization. Hyper-personalization is the provision of more relevant products and services to end users using data and technology. At the forefront of this approach is AI, artificial intelligence which takes data from several sources, often disparate sources, builds a comprehensive profile to make decisions accurately. So to understand hyper-personalization, consider Netflix, the video streaming service giant. According to Business Insider, Netflix estimates that a massive 80% of content watched by their subscribers comes from the company's personal recommendation engine. 
By successfully combining multiple data points with AI technologies, Netflix sends recommendations to their users about content. This shows how companies can leverage data and technology to create more successful, hyper-personalized services. The same practice can be applied to your advisory firm. In the context of financial advice, hyper-personalization is all about providing service, information, and advice, often on a daily basis or even several times a day by analyzing multiple data points associated with each individual client. This allows advisors to anticipate each client's individual needs and respond with personalized advice, goals, and objectives. RIAs that deliver true end-to-end -end personalization will build deeper relationships that stand the test of time, create a significant advantage over their competitors, and ultimately help them to grow and scale their business. To understand hyper-personalization, we can also just think about your most recent hotel stay. Were you greeted by name? Did you understand? Did they understand your needs and preferences? Was every detail taken care of just as you wanted it to be done? Perhaps not, but some hotels do give you this experience. Whether it's the Waterford story in New York, the Savoy or Dorchester in London, what makes them so special? Why do people keep on coming back? Simple answer is quality you can expect. It's a consistent experience day in, day out. Each and every small detail is taken care of. The beds are made perfectly, linen is freshly pressed, cutlery is precisely laid out. Even the cuisine is consistently of a high standard. This is how these brands become world famous. They deliver quality consistently and they attend to the smallest details of each and every customer, no matter who they are. Simply put, hyper-personalization means being constantly and consistently attentive to clients' needs across all of the multiple touch points of engagement you have with them. So what are the steps we might want to take for hyper-personalization? One of the things we can do is be responsive to clients' smallest needs. Make sure you're reviewing their holistic picture frequently, at least bi-weekly, but ideally weekly or even daily whenever something important comes up. Send useful, relevant, actual insights to them. This means reviewing their data, finding important or trending activity, and sending them an email alert or calling them to share it with them. Back it up with an article story or news item that they can review at leisure to get a fuller picture. Write a short key takeaway or action for them. Your interpretation of what they or their peers might actually do with this insight. Make it meaningful to them. Fordling conducted a survey of financial advisors to ask the following questions. How often do you share content pieces with your clients? And what we found is that the majority of advisors actually share content on a monthly basis. But look at that, many of them actually share it on a weekly or even bi-weekly basis. I think this is really key here is, is what is your competition doing? And clearly there's a, a high percentage of advisors out there that are providing this personalized service to clients. Michael Kiki has also did some research around the percentage of clients who would like their advisor to send interesting statistics, visuals, or articles relevant to their portfolio holdings. And interestingly, respondents over 50, 83% of them said yes, they would like that. And 65% of those, um, sorry, 83% under 50 want that, and 65 over 52. So what this means is that you do need to make sure your systems are in place to enable you to do this frequently and consistently and with good to high quality. Insights are not silver bullets, but taken together, they represent touch points with clients um, and high quality touch points. With greater frequency leads to a much better sense of superior service in that client experience. And of course, superior personalized service leads to an increase in organic referrals, increases in revenue by getting more wallet share and capturing it from competitors. Clients that are engaged, interested, and also think you offer incredible service. And also think about having no issues with client retention ever because you're constantly monitoring the holistic picture. And of course, finally, you can easily be able to justify your fees beyond investment performance. So let's get to your gains. 
how do you get that five hundred thousand dollars back how do you double your eom and grow at 30 percent so you're spending a lot of time gathering and collecting the data to reach out to clients and interact with them how can you cut down on that time so we've already touched on data aggregation get your data into one place so that you're reducing your time spent flicking between different apps trying to manually cross-link data and records get one client view make it easier for yourself by having your data all in one place uh, and in one view and content personalization use a system to help surface useful and interesting financial education news and thought leadership for your clients and of course finally you have to be making it hyper personalized make it personalized to your clients based on their interests don't just send them something generic one size does not fit all it's a surefire way to lose a client and waste a lot of time trying to create something that is general next we're going to get into the real juice of how you can cut down on that analysis time in activity five Activity five is all about automating analysis and cutting down on data analysis time. So the key to growing your practice is really about automation, automating client data analysis and processes. So if you think of each of these different systems and areas of client interest, you can create a, a checklist of items to review for each client account. And this is really the heart of the thesis here. Your checklist should cover the holistic client accounts. And here's one to get you started. So financial goals, how are clients doing against goals? Are they on track or off track? Check the CRM notes to see if any financial goals have been discussed. Is there anything to follow up on there? What dates did you discuss them and how long ago was that? Go to your, to your financial education source and find useful financial content pieces that ties directly to your client's goals and share this with them. Paste the link into your checklist. From a CRM and relationship standpoints. When was the last time you contacted your client? How many days ago? Are they due for a follow-up purely based on time? What did you talk about recently? Is there any product investment goal or interest that you should be following up with? What date were these items discussed? How is this relationship progressing? In the last year, has the client been positive or negative based on your read of the communication notes? Have you ever been, have you been providing good service to your clients? Do you really know that? How many times have you engaged with your client? Are they satisfied with your service? Are you regularly updating your CRM notes for each client? You should be logging every call, email, and client interaction to build the best possible picture for each client. Next is really portfolios and investments. So based on the discussions you've been having recently as captured in the CRM, go and check the client's portfolios for major moves. Is the portfolio on track? How has it changed in the last weeks, months, or quarter? Is the client's account doing well or performing poorly? Is there any interesting story in there that you'd like to pull out? So if it's doing well, go to your preferred news and research sources and find an interesting article to add color to why your client is doing well and evidence that you're doing a great job. If it's doing poorly, provide the same news or research article to help them understand what's actually happening in the markets and reassure them that you're on top of things despite negative news. Key life events and family dynamics. Scan through the CRM to ensure you're picking up on opportunities to support your clients through major life events, change and changing family dynamics. Flag these items. Look at that date. Provide a follow-up call and email along with content that is supported to their particular situation. There's a whole range of topics from estate planning, retirement planning, wealth transfer, divorce, loss of a spouse, disability, health and wellness planning and inheritances. All of these provide an opportunity to engage more deeply with the clients. And then personal interests. Check through recent and historic CRM notes and interactions to find personal interests that might help you connect with the client in more detail. Note the dates and interest topic and capture them in CRM. So now with your new client checklist, and I'm sure yours is a lot more sophisticated and in-depth than this, but this is just really to give you a little bit of a flavor here. So with your new client checklist, you really have three ways to automate this process for all of your clients. And you can imagine if you are doing this for all of your clients, they're gonna get a lot of great service, 
you're also going to get a lot of juice, a lot of ways to connect with the clients. So the three ways are really to do it yourself, hire support staff to do it, um, or automate it. And so let's start off with doing it yourself. So here you can create a checklist in Excel or Google Sheets for each client, leave it on a piece of paper, fill in this information on a bi-weekly or monthly basis, and you can then use this to track and monitor progress across your client base. You will have a gold mine of insights to share with them frequently. Um, of course, there's a derivative of this, which is doing it yourself with alerts. So if you use a CRM system, you can capture much of this information in one place. This will bring many efficiency gains. However, you still will need to be doing much of the interpretation, the analysis, the real review of that data. And yes, you can set up some alerts to help notify you of changing data, but it's really in all in your courts. You have to do all of that work. The second is really hiring support staff, for example, a power planner or a junior. They can do a lot of this analysis for you, and it certainly benefits to this approach. Uh, in fact, research shows that uh, advi lead advisors that do hire a power planner can cover more clients. A solo advisor typically about 75 versus about 125 with a power planner. And as a result of the, that deeper client work uh, and better service, those people that do hire support staff are able to gain more affluent clients, driving income up on average from 200,000 to 103,000 uh, for those without a power planner. Of course, this all depends on your client base. So um, you might very well be on that 200,000 mark and want to be driving that up significantly higher, doubling those earnings. Uh, so of course, the, you know, the drawbacks to this approach is that it's still subject to human error. And attention to detail does drop off quite rapidly when doing repetitive tasks. So I can imagine going through that checklist, maybe you have a more sophisticated one, as mentioned, and you're capturing all this information for 125 clients, it's changing every day. It gets pretty boring to, uh, to go over all of that detail. Uh, so, so, you know, are you gonna be missing something? And, um, and, and how much does that really help? So research shows that it actually adds back a couple more hours into business development uh, when you do have some degree of support. Um, and, you know, one of the other problems with this uh, approach is that, or drawbacks, let's say, is that they can only do so much work in a day. A power plan is limited by the number of hours in a day that they're working. And your limitation is that you have to cover the cost of their salary and benefits. You have to manage them uh, and, uh, and take on, on that additional uh, work and effort. The third approach is to automate your analysis checklist. Now there are cloud-based platforms that enable you to automate your checklist so that you don't have to do this work on a daily basis. A system like this should be able to do a few key things. Let's take a look at them. The first is to be able to read and review CRM notes for you. This is one of the most important tasks, constantly checking to see where you are with clients. The system should do this for you, pulling out what you need to know. Um, and of course, it's a bonus if, you can, if it can help you automate note taking. The second thing it should do is to read and analyze portfolios and pull out what matters. You already have a rich portfolio management system with a lot of data in it, but this is the problem. There's a lot of data in the portfolio management system. And uh, it can be challenging at times to pull out useful insights. So your system should be able to pull out these insights quickly and easily so that you don't have to do all of that laborious data analysis. Third is to understand financial terms, instrument goals, and personal interests. This is basically the bread and butter of your daily work life. It should be able to make the connection and integrate easily between your portfolio system and what you wrote down in CRM. In this way, you can cross check the human aspects with the functional aspects of the relationship. So if you went with option one or two, it will likely be quite difficult to review all your clients every day, if not impossible. 
there just isn't enough time in the day. So you may, may have to resort to weekly or bi-weekly or even monthly uh, reviews. Uh, and in all reality, it's probably only happening every quarter. If you select option three, uh, you can actually select how frequently you want that data analysis to be done because you that checklist has been done by uh, cloud computing with uh, parallel computing lightning fast speeds. So uh, that can be done as frequently as you want. It can be done weekly, daily, even entry day, if you, if you so please. So that's really how we start bringing this together through automation. In the next clip, we're gonna be talking about how to, the final step, which is prioritization of all of that analysis. In activity six, we're gonna bring it all together. Activity six is all about delivering an optimized service to your clients and saving a ton of time. And this is all about prioritization. So now that you've reviewed all of your client data holistically and done one pass of your whole client base, you can prioritize your time and the importance of each client to reach out to. Your list or the one your junior or outsource research has completed will likely have uh, three groupings of clients. Those clients with important and urgent activity, uh, which could come from planning, portfolio, family, interest, dynamics, goals, etc. Clients that have some activity, but it's not necessarily urgent. And then three clients with little activity and not requiring much attention right now. Uh, and this all comes down to uh, segmentation. So now that you've harvested the client data, you probably want to segment based on burning growth and retention opportunities. So what does that really look like? Uh, of course, your goal might be to increase wallet share, get client referrals and grow organically. And this is really the exciting parts, uh, which we're gonna get into. Uh, you also might be uh, wanting to flag any at risk or retention clients where there have been signs or trends that you might show, that might show the client is dissatisfied or hasn't been receiving attention from you. Or there's been particularly negative performance, feedback or negative trends. So each of these are really key to helping you grow your top line revenue. And of course, also protecting those revenues, keeping your retention rate up uh, by ensuring you don't miss anything. So let's uh, take a beat on segmentation and take a look into it a bit deeper. Many advisors segment their clients based on AUM or service levels that they pay for. There's no harm in doing this. It's a natural way to reduce the workload. Of course, that data specter is sucking up all of our time, as we all know. And segmentation works very well. SCI and Scorpio partners show that needs-based segmentation or segmentation based on behaviors is highly effective in delivering results for clients. And uh, they put together a neat graphic, which gives you a little bit of an idea of, of what this really looks like. And that is that uh, when you have standardized investment models or tier-based approaches, uh, it can be difficult to identify the client's uh, that really need your attention the most and are gonna be most productive uh, when you are reaching out to them. And so this is really where needs-based segmentation comes in, which is it's grouping them according to similar types of needs. Uh, again, it could be around those goals, uh, their desire for different service levels, et cetera. But if you're, uh, if you're able to focus on those clusters of clients that matter most, uh, to you, then you're going to get the best results out of that. Um, so, you know, in short, if you put a client into a service box based on their net worth, uh, it might not help you, uh, you know, to allocate your time and effort effectively. And of course, the behavioral based or needs based segmentation is really exactly everything we've been talking about and you've been doing this data gathering from your checklist. It simply means grouping clients together based on what is coming up for them and ensuring that you're matching your efforts to clients with the greatest and most important needs first. Yes, within that group, you might want to sort by AUM and pick off the highest value clients first within each of those categories 
But the key is spending your time where it is needed most and not wasting your time when there's little or nothing to do or a client is already satisfied with your service. So uh, our question might be then, who should do the prioritization? Humans or clouds and machines? So people are great at setting context, holding a bunch of data in our brains and applying it as, as context and overlay to new information that comes in to determine the relative importance of this new information. In general, this is how we prioritize our time, effort, and intention. If a new data point comes in and it's massively negative, it's likely going to instantly fire our adrenaline, get the heart pumping, and put our minds and bodies into alert and attack mode. If it's good, complimentary or positive, it may feel the ego, give you a confidence boost, and make you feel good about yourself. So the challenge with prioritization is that there are so many competing interests and data points when it comes to one individual client's data, let alone 75, 125, or even 200. So there are some shortcuts to this. Yes, you can have a, a shortcut checklist, which you can routinely look over, but even this is inefficient as you still have to constantly be checking this yourself and then digging deeper into the data to confirm whether or not it's relevant in the wider context. So each check, can lead you down a rabbit hole of data analysis and review when you might find in the end that there's nothing to do. If you select to do it yourself in your optimization exercise, you're going to have a ton of useful data to share with your clients. They're gonna be happy and so are you. But how many accounts did you review and find not much to do? It still took a lot of time and maybe it was worth it because you found one small important detail which saved you from losing that account how many other details are being overlooked if you had to use the shortcut method? And the same goes for the junior outsourced option. You're going to have to review all the accounts yourself and prioritize them. Once you have, the whole exercise will need to be done again and again and again and again. How long do you think it will take before you or they lose interest, flag off, get distracted, or just want to do something else? For some advisors, alerts are the way that they identify important activities to undertake and clients to reach out to. However, just responding to clients based on an open email or a like or a market move does not give you the important wider context of whether or not that client is important to you and important to your growth and the growth of the business. It requires your time and effort and attention at that point in time. So let's take a look at. So let's take a look. Take a look at how cloud prioritization is actually simple and useful. See, our human process that we have put together can be now automated. The machine is going to look through the data as you would, and flag up anything that it finds. Each item on the checklist is assigned a value, and then a score can be calculated by adding up the values. Together, the clients that are important and have the greatest need will automatically rise to the top of your list based on their score. A cloud-based prioritization system can be systematic and dynamic, uniformly applying your checklist to all your clients as frequently as you want. You can also tag certain items on your list or results from checklists as growth or retention-based opportunities. In essence, you're doing exactly what you'd be doing manually, all of that time and effort, and using a process that you've industrialized uh, and you're now offloading this data processing to the lightning fast cloud that can execute it just as you would giving you the results of the analysis cloud prioritization can also be expanded at any time so if you want to make a tweak to your checklist or you think of something new to add to it you don't have to go back to each and every client and laboriously add the analysis and information back in you can make one update and instantly apply this to all your clients. This ability to incorporate new analysis is super helpful. What if you wanted to look at trends over time? Again, this would require a lot of work to be done for every client in Excel or review one client's activity individually. Here the cloud works best as it only has to be done once and then can be applied to all clients over any number of lookback periods. Finally, cloud prioritization can help in sorting and optimizing your time. 
You may want to focus on individual checklist items and focus only on those items uh, that are relevant. What happens to the prioritization and segmentation when you do that? If it's manual, it's going to be a super huge headache to slice and dice in a pivot table or another few hours of having you or the junior relook at that data and recompute it. The cloud system can easily recalculate and reorder your list dynamically. So let's spend a moment and talk about scale. What does scale really mean? In simple terms, it means how we can use the same or marginal incremental efforts or resources and achieve the same results when we expand usage of a product or service to a wider number of people or users. One additional consideration for your practice optimization system is how much will it cost when you expand it to a wider number of advisors across your firm. Here, doing it yourself will likely bring mixed levels of efficiency because not all advisors may want to adopt your method of process industrialization or optimization. Hiring a junior advisor may be helpful, but in general, they may struggle to cover more than four advisors, and even then, that may be an overwhelming task. Cloud prioritization and execution has no limitations when it comes to scaling. In the same way your process is optimized for your clients, it can perform the exact same checklist on your colleagues' clients at the same time as yours. He or she can get their own prioritized, segmented, and optimized client lists, plus useful information to share just as you have. So if you have 10 advisors in your firm or 100, each person can have their own practice processes industrialized and automated for them so that they too can spend their time using the goldmine of insights surfaced from that data analysis versus having to do that themselves. And of course, what you're doing here is nothing new. It's actually just capitalism. And I love this here. So capitalism was founded on the core principles of profit maximization, that owners control the factors of production and derive their income from it. Capitalism incentivizes people to maximize the amount of money they earn through competition. And competition is the driving force of innovation as individuals create ways to accomplish tasks more efficiently. Industrialization of manufacturing and production led to capitalism. And of course, this is exactly what you're doing. Controlling your own factors of production, becoming more competitive by applying an innovative approach to industrializing your tasks more efficiently. And as a result, you make more money and stand apart when it comes to competition. So in summary, all you need to do is one, focus on clients that need attention. Two, be proactive. Three, reduce wasted data analysis time. Four, hyper-personalize your touch points. Five, automate analysis and cut down on wasted data analysis time. And six, prioritize. And with all of this, you can grow your advisory practice and deliver the best client experience without hiring anyone and saving at least half a million dollars along the way. Your alternatives to implement are these six steps. So there's a few ways you can achieve growth. You can start focusing all your time on improving client experience. However, you will have to hire support staff, pair planners, who can manage the back office operations for you. This will bring additional costs to hire and train the people. You will still have to go through your disparate client data manually, and there are still very limited hours in your day to focus on all your clients. Another alternative is investing in advanced AI technology to automate that for you. However, you will need a technical team that has both the business and technical expertise to implement such a solution. Developing such a technology internally will take you several years, or it could cost uh, a lot in terms of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even millions. Instead, you can use Foldlane's platform for financial advisors and RAs, and immediately start leveraging this advanced AI technology to automate your analysis, save time, and have many more meaningful interactions with your clients for about 1 20th the price and 1 20th of the efforts.